recording. And welcome everybody to the 149th episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. We appreciate everybody joining us today. We have a great topic of wolf recovery, conservation, and management in Minnesota with uh, Dan Stark. And Leslie is going to do an introduction to him. So I'll turn it over to you, Leslie. And I was going to announce before we start to, if anybody wants to adjust the layout, um, if you hover over your screen, click that layout button, you can hide participants without video, and that might clear up the top of your screens a little bit. So I think with that, we'll turn it over to Leslie and go from there. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Benji. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you all for joining the webinar today. My name is Leslie McEnany, and I'm the Wildlife Populations and Regulations Manager for Minnesota DNR. And as Benji mentioned, we've got Dan Stark here. He's our large carnivore specialist. Dan was originally hired to um, work for Minnesota DNR and implement the wolf management plan back in 2007. He's got over two decades of wolf management and research experience both here in Minnesota, as well as in um, the southwestern states in Arizona and New Mexico. He currently lives up in Grand Rapids. Uh, I know that wolves and deer are getting a lot of attention uh, this uh, past fall, this winter, a lot of conversation around that, and, and particularly um, conversations about the impacts that wolves might have on deer. We're not going to take a deep dive into that um, topic specifically. Uh, the webinar is intended to provide a real broad overview of wolves in Minnesota and, and that's going to Dan's going to go through recovery, conservation and management of wolves here in Minnesota. Uh, so just wanted to toss that out and, and also call out that we do have a presentation next Wednesday on, on this webinar series on uh, deer and winter. Uh, so we'll also have opportunities to dive in a little bit more about um, their survival uh, at that uh, session. So Dan, I'll just kick it off to you. Thanks. Thanks, Leslie, and welcome, everybody. Um, <clears throat> Minnesota's the only uh, state in the lower 48 that managed to maintain a wolf population while they were extirpated in all the others. And maybe at the lowest point um, was probably estimated around 400, 400 to 700 wolves. Um, we don't know, you know, exactly how many wolves occurred in Minnesota historically, but wolves once roamed the entire state. And um, by the early 1900s, um, they were eliminated from the southern part of the state. And by the about the 1930s, um, they were restricted to mostly the northern border counties um, along um, the southern border of Canada and into the Arrowhead region. Um, in the 1950s, some of uh, the, the cause of wolf population declines were eliminating, starting with aerial hunting. Um, that was banned in the 1950s, and uh, bounties were eliminated in 1965. And in 1966, the, the first Endangered Species Act was passed. Um, and although it didn't provide direct protection for wolves at the time, it was kind of the precursor to uh, the, the endangered species law that was passed in 1973. Um, at, at the time that wolves were listed under the Federal Endangered Species Act in 1974, it was estimated that there were about 1,000 wolves in Minnesota. And by 1978, um, the population um, was estimated to be about 1,250 wolves. And because Minnesota had a, a pretty significant wolf population at the time, they were reclassified under the Endangered Species Act of Threatened. So while wolves remain fully endangered and in other parts of the country, um, Minnesota had a different classification. And there's basically two classifications under the endangered species, the Federal Endangered Species Act, threatened, which is um, uh, the lower protection in which a species may be at, at risk of becoming endangered. And then in, in endangered is considered when a species at, is at risk of potentially coming extinct. So, um, again, by 1978, uh, wolves were reclassified. 
wolves were starting to show up in different places in Minnesota, including parts of Aiken and Pine County, uh, west into Beltrami County. And they were also starting to show up in places uh, like Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, the reclassification of, of wolves in Minnesota allowed a little more management flexibility where wolves were, were killing livestock and pets. And that's essentially been in place since that time. By about 1995, wolves were starting to establish uh, south of Mille Lacs Lake and in central Minnesota near Camp Ripley and, and as well as, you know, further west, kind of pushing south and west towards Park, Park Rapids, uh, Bemidji, and, uh, you know, the northwestern corner of the state. And by the late 1990s, there were enough wolves in Minnesota, approximately 2,500, and also uh, combined between Michigan and Wisconsin, about 400 wolves. And so the wolf had become considered for removal from the Endangered Species Act. And, you know, our, our wolf population expanded pretty rapidly starting in the early 1970s, and that accelerated up until the late 1990s, but since that time, we've seen uh, a pretty um, st stable population in both number and, and distribution, and, and we'll get into some more details on that in a, in a minute. So, just to, for, for context, you know, werewolves occurred historically in the lower 48 states. Um, Pretty much the entire Western US, um, the Midwest, and into parts of, of North, the Northeastern US. Although there is still some debate as to whether, you know, it was gray wolves or a distinct species considered the Eastern wolf. Um, and there's still some ongoing debate about that. Um, but we're going to focus on gray wolves. Um, at the time that they were listed, again, the only population. Um, in the lower 48 was um, the northern part of Minnesota, although technically there were also wolves on Isle Royal in Michigan. Um, and since that time, we've had wolves expand into Wisconsin and Michigan, um, as well as wolves have been established in Montana and Idaho and uh, uh, Wyoming. They're starting to recolonize parts of Washington, Oregon, and in uh, California as well. And then of course, in the Southwest, the Mexican wolf has been reintroduced and there's now a population of about 250 wolves there. Um, so this just gives you an idea that kind of the current distribution of wolves, the yellow um, shaded areas is, is, is generally where wolves currently occur. Um, one thing that's missing is there has recently been uh, wolves reintroduced into Colorado um, and, and some wolves that have shown up uh, from that Wyoming uh, population moving south. And so from a legal status, if you're not paying um, close attention to this, it can be a bit confusing about how we got here. And so I'm going to give you a, you know, a little bit of an overview of the legal status of wolves in Minnesota and, and the rest of the lower 48. Um, currently, wolves in Minnesota, again, are listed as threatened, and that's been um, generally the classification since 1978. Although um, wolves remain listed as threatened, the federal government has attempted to transfer management authority from of, of the wolf to the states and tribes in uh, Minnesota four times now. And all of these delisting decisions have been reversed by the courts. Um, you know, primarily the decision has been, you know, not based specifically on the conservation or the population status of wolves. It's been more um, in relation to the legal aspects of implementation of the Endangered Species Act and the process by which they um, went through to delist wolves. Um, you know, wolf populations, as, as we'll get into detail here, and the numbers of wolves and the distribution have significantly expanded. Um, and there are other states where wolves currently are off the endangered species list, including 
uh, Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, and then also uh, the eastern portion of Washington and Oregon. They remain listed as endangered throughout the other lower uh, about 44 states. And then this portion of Arizona and New Mexico is the um, is a separate listing for the Mexican wolf subspecies. So wolves occur throughout the northern portions of Minnesota, um, primarily the you know the forested parts of the state. As you go further south and west, um, the wolf population expansion has slowed or become relatively static since about the late 1990s. Um, most of the suitable areas in in Minnesota that are that support wolves uh, have been occupied since that time, and now. You know, a wolf could occur anywhere in Minnesota. We do have wolves show up in, in places that you don't typically expect, um, as far south as Rochester, um, near Marshall. Um, they do have the ability to travel pretty far distances. And, and one of the um, aspects of wolf biology, as younger wolves mature and leave the pack, they're out there searching for a, an area to get established. Now, um, we haven't seen wolves get established in, in those places. Um, and there's probably some limitations just based on the landscape. Um, higher human populations, higher road densities, um, and just generally more human activity. And the, the land is more fragmented from those activities. So it, it hasn't really supported wolf populations. Um, but again, generally, we had an expanding and increasing wolf uh, distribution from the 1970s through the 1990s, and uh, it, it has remained relatively static since that time. Canis lupus or the gray wolf, um, locally wolves have been referred to as the timber wolf. And this is to distinguish it from coyotes, which, you know, sometimes have been referred to as brush wolves. Uh, the Ojibwe refer to the wolf as Mayingan, and they hold a pretty uh, significant um, cultural value to the seven Ojibwe nations that occur in Minnesota's wolf range. And I'm not intending into going into all the basics on, you know, different wolf characteristics and, you know, the specifics of their biology. Um, there's a lot of good biological and behavioral information out there about wolves. There's numerous books, um, resources online, and in Minnesota, we have, you know, some great opportunities to, to learn about wolves um, and see them in person. Um, and, and you can go visit these places, such as the Wildlife Science Center, the International Wolf Center, or the Minnesota Zoo, and, and learn more about wolves and kind of the specific um, biology and behavior of of wolves. This is pretty typical of a, a wolf in Minnesota. Um, generally, you know, just kind of this gray color phase. Um, but this is, you know, typical of an animal that you that, you know, if you happen to see one in Minnesota, that that um, you might come across. Minnesota has a long history of wolf research, and um, nearly continuous studies have occurred since the 1930s, starting with uh, Milt St or Sigurd Olson, who you know snowshoed to, to track wolves and learn about the their behavior and the area that they um, they covered and the number of individuals in a pack, or Milt Stenlin um, back in the 1950s, who studied wolves from an airplane. Um, in the Superior National Forest. And a lot of these early techniques kind of sparked the scientific interest um, in wolf research that, that continue today. Uh, recently, Dave Meech concluded a, a, a more than 50 year study of wolves in Northeastern Minnesota that kind of pioneered the work on radio te telemetry on large mammals and provided a pretty detailed understanding of the closely linked predator-prey relationship. Today, there's multiple tribal, state, federal, 
um, and university organizations conducting wolf research in, in Minnesota. And the information is really valuable for providing insights into how wolves live on the landscape. It helps the DNR's ability to, to conduct population surveys on the wolf population in Minnesota. And historically, there's been efforts to estimate wolf numbers um, that go back to the 1950s. And, you know, as I have, as I previously um, identified, you know, some of those were were more subjective and were not done in a, you know, a systematic way. But since the late 1970s, the Minnesota DNR has conducted systematic wolf population surveys using a, a fairly consistent methodology was initially conducted at 10 year intervals um, and more recently has been been done annually since about 2013. And there's, um, we're looking at both the population size, how many wolves there are, and then the distribution where wolves occur. Um, the main wolf survey that, that we do is conducted um, less frequently. Uh, we, we, we want to estimate where wolves occur, and we do this by recording observations that, that natural resource staff uh, that work for the DNR and other agencies um, as they observe wolf sign and activity in the winter months. Um, that information gets collected and recorded and kind of gives us a course distribution of where wolves are in the state. Um, it also incorporates the, the um, uh, where wolves are killed or where there are depredation conflicts, where wolves kill livestock um, or wolves get killed. And so um, there's, a, there's a number of different um, sources of information that go into that. And then the other part of um, determining the, the total wolf range is, you know, not just determining where wolves, um, where that outer distribution is, but also you know, what areas of the state are occupied. And we do this based on the observations, but we also want to account for areas that, that there may not be observations. So generally, um, where wolves, um, based on radio collared wolves occur, you know, there are um, some features of, of um, the landscape, whether it's road density or human population density that has been documented not to support wolves. And so if it exceeds those thresholds, it's generally excluded from the range. If it's not, it would be included. And then more specifically, we want to get to get the population estimate. We need information on both pack size and territory size. And so that's done by radio collaring wolves and looking at their movements over the winter months to get those territory sizes, as well as count the wolves in the packs um, to come up with that average. So combined, you know, all this information is, is a bit like putting a, a puzzle together with the, the wolf range being, you know, the outer distribution, um, and then the pack size and territory size being the pieces that all fit together within that. The most recent wolf population estimate was conducted the winter of 22 and 23. Um, we estimated the average winter pack size to be about four and that there were about 630 packs in Minnesota. Um, pack territory estimates averaged about 45 square miles, um, but based on, on the different packs that were, were um, monitored, that ranged from 14 to over 150 square miles. The wolf population estimate was 2,919 wolves, and that incorporates a, um, an assumption that there's about 15% of the population are lone wolves that aren't associated with a pack. And based on some of the wolf research that's been conducted in Minnesota, there's been observations that, you know, about 10 to 20 percent of wolves are not directly um, associated with a pack over the winter months. The full survey um, report is available online, so you can look at this information in more detail. 
Um, and then also look at past reports that uh, the DNRs has available there. Um, you know, although the wolf population estimates change year to year, it's been relatively static going back to the late 1990s. There's also a confidence interval that's associated with those population estimates. Um, and so, you know, as you can see, going back, um, those confidence intervals widely overlap. And so, you know, all there's, although there's some variation year to year, it's, it's remained relatively stable. We also do these estimates in the winter months, primarily because that's the easiest time to count wolves because there's snow on the ground, um, allows us to see wolves from the plain or, or be able to observe tracks. It also is the time of the year that uh, the wolf population is at its lowest point. So it's right before pups are born in the spring. And uh, um, so it, it gives us that, it's in kind of the annual wolf population estimate, um, it's kind of at its lowest point. So wolves prey on a variety of species, but in Minnesota, it's white-tailed deer that are the primary focus. Probably some 95% of the state's wolves rely on deer as the primary prey. In Minnesota's moose range, wolves focus more on moose, um, and it's generally consistent that where wolves live, whether it's Minnesota or other places, they, they feed on large hoofed animals, such as elk, deer, and moose. Um, at times of the year, they are gonna supplement that with anything they can catch, including beaver, snowshoe hare, or other small mammals, um, and also domestic animals like cattle, sheep, and turkeys. Um, it's, it's been estimated that to support the nutritional requirements of a wolf throughout the year, that a, that a wolf would need to kill the equivalent of about 15 to 20 adult-sized deer each year. And they do this by killing primarily the most vulnerable animals that they can catch. Older, injured, weak, um, young, you know, less than one year old, bucks that are weakened after the rut, or migrating animals between summer and winter range. And they're doing this um, and exploiting those weakened weaknesses. And given it's easier to catch the animals that are more vulnerable, the population must also be sufficient in in number for wolves to take advantage of that. So if a deer density gets too low, you would expect eventually that wolf numbers are gonna decline because there aren't um, the same number of animals out there to support that higher wolf population. Where, where moose occur and recent declines have been observed, there has been concerns about the impacts that wolves have on, rec on recruitment and um, uh, the impacts that they're having on moose calves. And recently the moose population has stabilized, but the long-term trend still um, shows some sign of a decline. And the complexity of this issue is, you know, it's confounded by, you know, adult moose health um, caused by disease, predation, and other habitat conditions. Um, with the high de deer density, um, you know, generally there isn't as much concern expressed by deer hunters. And um, when deer populations are low and hunter ha harvest is down, concerns from hunters often um, are expressed. And we can look at some of the deer harvest trends in Minnesota's wolf range and um, point out some of the kind of key um, drops in, in deer harvest that occurred in relation to some of the factors that influenced that. And we saw a pretty significant increase from the 1970s up until about 2007. Um, this uh, table represents the deer harvest in generally in Northeastern Minnesota where we have wolves. Um, and it's, it's a pretty complex system. You know, we think it's important that there's ongoing research to kind of fill the gaps on how our knowledge of overall predator densities, forest habitat, 
um, hunter preferences and behavior and weather conditions all interact to influence deer survival. But some of the key periods here that I'll point out um, following, you know, of course, these harvests occur in the fall. Um, so each year is the fall harvest and preceding that would be the winter, you know, of 95, 96. We had a pretty significant drop in deer harvest that fall in 96. Same thing in 97. Deer numbers came back pretty, pretty rapidly following that. Um, we had a number of years with really mild conditions and kind of hit our peak in, in 2007. There were also during that time, there were concerns from a lot of different um, uh, land, land users that, you know, were ha having concerns about too many deer. So there was pretty intensive hunting opportunities um, and more liberal harvests. And you can see based on the number of antlered deer to antler lists that we had much higher deer harvest during those times. Um, again, some of the points of more severe winters that have occurred 2013 and 14, followed by a, a pretty significant drop in deer harvest. It's been a little more gradual in recent years, um, but it's still kind of showing evidence that, um, you know, these trends have been consistent over time with the influence of uh, deeper snow winters. Um, in response to this, you know, we've we've adjusted harvest of analyst deer um, and we understand the frustrations that are are um, that folks are having in regard to the deer harvest. Um, going forward, we're going to continue to evaluate population trends, adjust analyst harvest, um, support habitat assessment and management that meets the needs of deer, um, especially in those winter months when habitat conditions and, and they need that escape cover um, to be able to both get out of the deep snow but avoid predation um, and then you know look at it in more detail with some of the research that's been currently going with the relationship between deer um, habitat conditions and wolf predation So there's an image here of a, a wolf walking near some livestock. And in between that, there is a, uh, some red streamers, and this is called flattery. Um, this is one of uh, the preventative methods that has demonstrated to be um, effective at helping reduce livestock losses. Sometimes it may be short term, but, you know, prevention may be best implemented before those conflicts occur. So use of fencing, guard animals, um, carcass disposal, monitoring the herds and moving herds that might be, um, or animals that might be um, uh, sick or injured. Um, there's a variety of different tools um, that can be appropriate for use depending on the conditions and timing. But it also depends on the costs associated with those and the implementation and the effectiveness. Um, you know, in addition to the population monitoring and research, a lot of wolf management focuses on wolf-human conf conflict. It's related, that's related to livestock depredation. And depredation and management, um, depredation management and conflicts have been, you know, going on for, for decades uh, wolf depredation on livestock, where, where livestock are killed by wolves, um, cause con considerable conflict and expense to, to livestock producers in Minnesota. And it has economic impact on individuals. Um, but there has been a program in place to try to address this and, you know, help providing technical guidance and information to producers and um, tools to, to prevent it. But also in response, um, to when wolves kill livestock or pets. There's been a program in place since the late 1970s um, so that when wolves kill livestock, those wolves uh, can be tra trapped and killed. Um, the number of farms in Minnesota um, that have had conflicts um, generally increased. So, you know, from the time that 
um, wolves, wolf population numbers increased up until the late 1990s. Um, and since that time, it's, it's kind of fluctuated year to year. Um, and it, it again is another indice of, you know, kind of wolf population status, both in distribution and range um, that we haven't continued to see that trend go up. But there's a number of things that influence this as well. So generally on average, about 70, 80 farms each year have livestock killed uh, by wolves. And in response to that, about 170 to 180 wolves are killed. Um, and this, this program continues um, to this day. It's primarily administered by the, the USDA Wildlife Services or the federal trappers that respond to the complaints. Uh, Minnesota DNR enforcement officers go out and investigate claims and help uh, verify the claims. And then those get re referred to wildlife services for trapping and control. And there's also been a compensation program in place since the late 1970s that's administered by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And so that pays livestock owners for um, cattle, or other animals that are killed by wolves, um, and it pays them at the fair market value. So there's a assessment of what that animal would be worth. Um, and over the last five years, that's averaged, um, again, about 100 animals are killed every year, and total claims are about $150,000 a year. So wolves and wolf management get a lot of attention and are a topic that many people feel passionate about. And it's not surprising that there's differences in, in the values and attitudes that people have. Often they conflict with each other. Um, it's important that uh, wolf management reflects, you know, the, the needs and interests and values of all the people of Minnesota, not just those with the loudest voices. And, you know, we've, taken this approach through our, our wolf management planning. Um, we initiated a, a public attitude survey that was a random sample of, of residents of Minnesota, livestock producers, and um, Minnesota deer hunters. Um, generally, the results indicated that there was strong support for maintaining a wolf population in Minnesota, that there was support to you know, have wolves at similar population numbers and, and kind of the current areas that they occur. Um, there, there was, you know, a difference in support for having a hunting season um, and it generally was split. So, um, you know, that's one of the areas where there's obviously differences and there's meaningful differences that, that people have in the beliefs and management preferences for wolves. But overall, it, it demonstrates that you know, there's a diversity of opinions among the public. Um, we want to make sure that we incorporate that into any management program that we have and, um, and use that going forward. So we've recently adopted a, a Minnesota wolf management plan and the process, um, had had a broad background for public in, input and engagement. Um, the intent was to update the information in the 2001 wolf plan based on new information that we have about wolves collected over the last several decades. Um, the plan reflects that information collected over time, the input gathered through public attitude surveys, tribal engagement, public engagement, and both a technical and an advisory committee um, review. And so, um, you know, the wolf plan builds on that success of, of past wolf conservation efforts. Uh, the population is well established across um, suitable areas of the state, and it's really been stable for decades. Uh, we have the largest wolf population in the lower 48, and we have a strong, a strong footing. Um, the plan is intended to help guide wolf management over the next 10 years. The plan incorporates 
you know, background information on wolf conservation and management. Um, but it also kind of summarizes, you know, the fundab fundamental policy questions that are critical to support wolves. Diverse and changing values, tribal wolf interests. Um, these were developed in collaboration with tribal staff on our, our wolf technical committee. The agency resources to support wolves. Um, wolf predation concerns, both on wild and domestic animals and wolf population objectives, as well as wolf research um, and monitoring and to support kind of the general vision, you know, it's established these 6 goals. And the goals are our long term outcome oriented statements. Um, that were developed through public tribal and other stakeholder. Um, input to help formulate um, all these things. You know, we, we generally um, adopted many of the, the previous information from the wolf plan. Um, a lot of the background information was included from that. But going uh, going forward, there's there's some new information. So Acknowledging tribal nation sovereignty and for an emphasis on tribal and public perspectives and partnerships establishment of, you know, a standing technical committee to help advise uh, wolf management recommendations. And then we're, we're also providing clarification on our wolf population objectives. So generally maintain populations at the current level um, and describing those management actions. If there's increases or decreases in the population. And so some of the other opportunities that we see going forward are to, to make sure we secure long term funding to support wolf management, um, identify the resources and provide technical guidance to help prevent wolf depredation and then just information and educate education sharing, you know, with some of the information like we're we're. Um, doing today. And so then just the last thing to wrap up, you know, Minnesota has a robust wolf population that occupies nearly half of the state. It's considered one of the most successful endangered species um, success stories in, in North America. You know, wolves were once isolated to the northern border counties. They now occur in 31 counties um, where we have nearly half the entire wolf population in the lower 48 states and the issues related to wolf management, you know, haven't changed that much in the last 40 years. You know, we still hear about the concerns that people have on impacts to deer and moose impacts to livestock. Is the population at, at risk? Um, and what are we going to do? You know, is there opportunities to have a hunting and trapping season for wolves? And there's not going to be agreement on all these issues. Um, but all of them should be considered with, you know, kind of a long term vision for conservation, finding solutions and continue to assure, you know, we have a, a healthy wolf population here in Minnesota and the department will continue to manage wolves regardless of the legal status. We want to assure that, uh, we have a successful conservation strategy strategy that, um, addresses or or continues to support the wolf population and address conflicts where they occur. And with that, I think we probably have some time for questions. Thanks, Dan. Uh, good overview covered a lot of a lot of ground. We've got a number of questions here, so I'll just start um, trying to tick some of these off. Uh, the first one is, uh, how do you determine a wolf popu population is established? or if it's just a young wolf searching for new territory. And I know you um, also mentioned lone wolves as well. So we'll have a follow-up question about that. Yeah, it's generally over time. You know, if a pack shows up in an area and they have, have pups and are able to raise those pups um, for, you know, a couple of uh, generations, then they're established. But we have had places where wolves have shown up um, had had pups and then just don't persist. And th that, those are kind of on those edges of that outer distribution of, of where I showed we have wolves in Minnesota. Um, 
you know, I, I guess one example, we had a, a wolf last winter down um, that was radio collared that spent time um, kind of between Isanti and North Branch and Cambridge. And it's, you know, a, a more human populated area than, than you would typically expect to see wolves. Um, um, but since then, it's moved back further north. So, you know, they might show up in places, but, you know, whether they persist just takes time to really, um, you know, get more information on. And it, it, if they're there over a number of years, then that kind of gets incorporated into that wolf range. Thanks, Dan. And then the follow up, um, there was a question about how typical are lone wolves overall. I think you mentioned, you know, in the population estimate, uh, that we we uh, recognize that there are likely lone wolves out there, and you mentioned 10 to 20 percent um, during the winter. Uh, the question is: Is that 10 to 20 percent in the winter figure normal, or you know, does that vary by season? I guess. Yeah, it, it's it's just based on radio tracking of wolves, and um, you know, sometimes those wolves that are are associated with packs, you know, it's clear they're tied with a group. Other times they're not, and so. It's, there's there's some summary information based on some of the research, and that's why we've incorporated that 15%. How many wolves are colored by Minnesota DNR? Is that and is that information online anywhere? Yeah, in the wolf population survey reports, um, there is a map that will include all the packs that are monitored for that survey, and it's not just the DNR. It includes tribal partners, um, other agencies that have have radio collars on and other organizations that might be tracking wolves. We, we collaborate with all those people to get information um, from those different projects that are going on and kind of pool the information to be able to look at, you know, um, get a, a larger sample, but also being able to um, um, look at a broader distribution of wolves in different places across the state and not just have it focused in one place. So I, I think another, you know, it oh, averages sorry. somewhere between probably 35 and 45 packs each winter that, that are monitored. Thanks, Dan. Um, there's another question. Uh, if, if someone finds a collared wolf, who should they contact? And I, I suppose that the answer might differ if they observe them. Um, living in the wild, or if they were, you know, found one road killed or something like that. Yeah, if it's, you know, if it's a dead wolf, then they should contact um, a DNR conservation officer and report it. Um, a live wolf you can contact one of the wildlife um, biologists in Grand Rapids. John Herb is our wolf research biologist, or or just contact a local wildlife office, and they can can refer you to the right right place. Thanks. Another question, um, what's the percentage of wolves dying off from winter kill or natural selection per year on average? Or maybe rephrase that, what, what's sort of the natural mortality rate of, of wolves? Yeah, it varies quite a bit. Um, you know, in some years it could be relatively low, in other years it could be higher. And, and you know, there has been some survival analysis in Minnesota, but it's generally been around 70 to 80 percent of the wolves survive each year, um, you know. So that would, you know, probably be on average about 20 percent of the population is is going to die. You know, pup survival is one of those things that's kind of hard to get at because, um, you know, they're smaller animals. You you got to it's pretty invasive to go in and monitor the health and survival of pups, but it's expected that that's pretty low um just based on the number of wolves in a pack you know even if a if a female gives birth to five or six pups in the spring and there's four or five wolves in the pack already we don't typically see 10 the next year it still tends to be around four or five so some of those adult wolves may leave through dispersal some of them may die maybe only a couple of pups replace those other adults so yeah I'm going to jump um, beyond Minnesota for a question. Uh, one came in. Do you know where the wolves um, that were reintroduced from into Yellowstone came from? Yeah, most of them came from Alberta, Canada. 
Thanks. Uh, I'm just go, looking through these questions here. I have land in Fergus Falls area and see wolves occasionally on our trail cams, but only in the winter. Do wolves have a different range in winter than summer? Yeah, so most of the pack territories that that you know we we look at it it includes their entire range for the for a year um, and their use of that may be um, different throughout the year so they could have more a smaller core use area that they use in the summer months especially when they're raising pups they're going to be more localized around that area maybe travel between where those pups are to you know forage or catch prey and bring it back to there. So they may not travel as far, at least as a pack, you know, as they would in the winter as those pups get older and can travel with the adults. So yeah, it's possibility that, you know, they're only using part of that territory or using parts of that territory more during different times of the year. This, this is a question that goes uh, back to the, um, hunting and trapping season DNR had uh, in um, the mid 2010s. I just I lost it for a second. Oh, here it is. Why was um, hunting wolves allowed the same year they were taken off the, the threatened list? Well, Minnesota has a state law that allows the DNR to consider a season once they come off the endangered species list. Um, and that first year that the timing of it allowed for the DNR to propose a season and and plan for it that that fall and win, that fall and winter following that. So, um, yeah, I think generally it's just following a, a process like we do with with setting other seasons and and whether or not the timing of it allows. We have a lot of information on on wolf population numbers and we're able to you know evaluate that and and make a recommendation on what a what a season could look like, and and that's how we approached it. Uh, do you have any information on wolf attacks on humans? Uh, and then there's a follow up question. Any advice to hikers who like going into wild areas, um, such as the boundary waters? Yeah, we've we've had one attack um, of a person in Minnesota that that occurred in 2013 and it, it was a little bit odd the person was camping at a campground um, they were sleeping outside and a and a wolf bit that person on the back of the head while they were out in their sleeping bag and it was a pretty significant injury um, but we also found out that that wolf had um, a deformity um, there was kind of a narrowing of of the nasal cavity, and it um, uh, looked like it had caused an, an infection and then some swelling up into the to the brain. Um, so that's a little bit unique. We we haven't had other attacks um, on people, um, but it's always one of those. It's even though it's rare, it's one of those things I think people should be um, aware of. Um, take some caution because they are large carnivores and there's a possibility that they could injure a person. Um, most of the attacks in North America that have happened have been related to, to wolves being habituated to people. And so they get fed or they are approaching people that, you know, um, there's a, a food source that, you know, they're getting accustomed to or comfortable with. And so anything that discourages wolves from approaching people um, like not, you know, feeding pets outside, making sure, you know, just like with bears, you're, you're keeping your area clean and free of any, you know, potential attractants. Um, and then, you know, if there are concerns, there are things that you can do to, to try to, um, scare wolves away. And it could include air horns or, or bear spray, um, you know, just staying in a group, um, and, uh, you know, if 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 there was an attack, it's recommended that you fight back and you know hit the animal with anything that you can, um, just to try to try to get it to to back away. So there's a similar question um, 
how can I defend my pets against wolves? And you touched on some of the items. Um, and then why can't I shoot a wolf to save a pet? Yeah, currently under federal law, you can't shoot a wolf um, to protect to protect livestock or pets. The only allowance for an individual to, to kill a wolf would be in defense of human life. Um, uh, under state law, that's a little bit different. Um, the state law does allow, you know, so if they were taken off the federal endangered species list, the state law would allow an individual to, to shoot a wolf if it was attacking um, their livestock or pets. But there are some preca precautions you can, can take. Um, you know, be vigilant about wolf activity in your area. Um, if you see sign of wolves, you know, uh be be more protective of your pets don't let them run around outside unattended you know keep them under verbal control or even as you're walking with with a leash um and you know fencing of course would help you know any type of uh, motion activated lights might help you know things that you know wolves may not be used to as they approach um it can be kind of an un un uh, settling feeling to have wolves in your backyard, but we live in a place where, you know, we have wolves often um, as, you know, we live in rural parts of the state, um, especially in the northern parts of the state. And uh, there's some additional guidance on our website to help help um, folks do that. But it's still a pretty rare incident. Um, generally, wolves are going to back off um, once people are present, but that's not always the case and it and it can be a it can be a problem. It's a question, um, a couple of questions about um, wolves and coyotes. And one, uh, does one influence the other more, which is more dominant? Um, do they compete for food? And which has more impact on uh, Minnesota animal populations? Yeah, so coyotes occur throughout most of the state. Um, they historically, you know, probably weren't as common, but um, as the wolf population was reduced or or restricted in the northern part of the state, it, it probably created an opportunity for coyotes to get more established. Um, they do overlap some, but where we have higher densities of wolves, they they tend to exclude coyotes or at least you know they're they're not as common and at lower densities um you know there's always going to be some overlap wolves will uh kill coyotes and um you know as far as like an overall impact you know i i, th I think it's it's probably a difficult to get at what you know how many bonds a coyote might kill or you know, compared to what a wolf might kill. Um, and we don't, we just don't have a direct measure of that, you know, to really um, put a good, good number on it. But there has been some recent research that we've looked at fawn survival um, that I think um, maybe there was a previous Moss webinar talking about that project, or um, we have some resources online that, that could help um, give some additional detail on. Anyway, um, yeah, generally wolves, are gonna be more aggressive with coyotes. They're kind of the dominant animal. Obviously they're bigger, nearly twice the size or more and uh, cover a bigger territory. Whereas coyotes are kind of smaller, more adaptable, kind of fit in the niche areas and are more common, you know, south and west of, of wolf range. A related question, um, how, how can people differentiate a wolf from a coyote? What what are your tips in terms of field observations? Yeah, mostly by size. Um, wolves are going to be twice as big as a, a coyote. Um, you know, if you can see tracks of where the animal was, that's going to give you a, a pretty good indication. A, a wolf track could be, you know, three and a half inches or in size or more, whereas a coyote might be about half that or, you know, two and a half inches or smaller. Um, some general characteristics a coyote kind of looks more delicate they've got a more point more pointy features pointy ears their ears look bigger in relation to their head um, they, they tend to look longer than they are tall whereas a wolf just looks more stocky you know they kind of have more blocky features and look taller than they are long and 
Um, so yeah, from individuals standing out in a field, unless they're standing right next to you, it might be hard to distinguish, but um, some of those characteristics might help. Thanks. Uh, since white-tailed deer uh, were not native to northern Minnesota before logging, uh, what did wolves prey on? Yeah, wolves, well, the, the prey that were available or the ungulates that were in Minnesota included caribou, moose, elk, um, and and deer were, you know, more restricted to kind of the, the southeastern, south-central part of the state. So, historically, it was was caribou, moose, elk, bison, you know, and probably in the northern part of the state, you know, mostly caribou and moose. But that's changed drastically, right? Since the early 1900s, um, deer have, have become pretty well established across northern Minnesota. So we, I know we're closing in on the end of the hour. I've got to maybe we can squeeze in a couple more questions here. Uh, how do you predict that this mild winter will affect wolves or um, what are your thoughts, Dan, in terms of the Yeah, cer of the certainly winter? this winter is, is favorable for deer. You know, they're gonna have a easier time getting through the winter um, and are gonna be, it's gonna be easier for deer to escape wolves. And um, it's more challenging with mild conditions for wolves and uh, for, for them to catch and, and kill their prey. Um, or at least not to the same degree that they would in a, a more severe winter. So, um, yeah, it could it could have some effect on you know reduced pup uh, survival in the spring if if adult wolves are having a harder time catching deer. There's a question um, about whether um, it says, do the panelists believe a healthy wolf population would help limit spread of CWD into our northern regions? I know there's been some publications out there. Yeah, you know, there, there hasn't been a lot of information directly where um, CWD occurs and wolves overlap, but, you know, wolves tend to target the slower, you know, uh, compromised animals and a, a, a deer that's infected with CWD, although it takes time for those, you know, um, signs to develop a, a wolf, it could be more susceptible to wolf predation. You know, that's one, you know, theory, um, but there's really been no field study to test that. And, you know, it, it could, there have been places where wolf predation has Kind of been shown to help slow or control a disease, um, but um, you know it. It also it, we're not really sure how um, because CWD prions are remain infectious, even though a wolf would kill you know an, a CWD infected animal, they're still going to consume that, and those prions are still on the landscape. Um, so. You know, it, it could reduce that direct disease transmission from deer to deer, but um, those prions could still be. What I what I guess I'm saying is we don't have a whole lot of information yet on that. Um, but theoretically, there are some influences that wolves could have on you know both CWD and the spread of the disease. So, you know, how that plays out, I think, you know, we could gain some more information over time, but. Hopefully we don't have as much CWD in Minnesota um, to find out as well. Right. You know, we don't yeah, really definitely have... a complex uh, question. I see Benji popped on, so we're kind of at our time limit here. Dan, this has been a great presentation. Benji. You can... Yeah, well, thank both of you for uh, joining us today, Leslie and Dan. Um, there's a ton of interest in this. Obviously, we might have to do another webinar. Sometime in the future, we had over 100 questions in the Q&A, and it's just we could be here for another hour trying to answer them all. So unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Um, thank you, everybody who joined us. Um, reach out if you do have other questions and want to get answered. Um, we will do our best to, to try to answer those. But Leslie and Dan, thanks again for joining us today. Hopefully, everybody has a great and safe weekend outside, enjoying the great outdoors in Minnesota, and hopefully we'll see you next week. Uh, we were talking, Todd Froberg is going to join us and talk about uh, winter deer habitat and behaviors and feeding. So kind of ties into this a little bit. So 
hopefully we'll see everybody next week and then everybody have a safe weekend and thanks again.